but I think I'm standing between you guys and the rest of your weekend, um, which I don't think there's a real, I don't think I win that debate in any way, shape, or form. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit real quick about uh, what do we, how do we pick things off the shelf, um, as there are a lot of options out there. And so, clicker, no, mouse, sure. So I think the first question is to see what's on your shelf. Uh, that really dictates for, at least in my institution, what I use uh, as I have a little vested interest in what's on the shelf uh, most of the time. Um, and I'll explain why in a bit. But sometimes when you go and see what's on the shelf, it just sort of leaps out at you that there are uh, lots of things that you can use, some that are uh, allograft-ish, some that are autograft-ish, some that are in between, and some that come with a, a plethora of marketing material that goes with them. And when you look at this, it's a bit of an orthopedic trauma um, alphabet soup with all the letters and the acronyms out there for all the biologics that are available. And so you're sort of left scratching uh, your head as to what to do, which biologic should I use? I don't want to, to take it from the patient for whatever reason. I think uh, Chris laid out a, a, a several reasons why you may not consider using autographed maybe. Uh, but then you look at the data out there, and the data is a bit sparse when you think about um, uh, the amount of biologics that are present in our field. Uh, and so I, I always like this slide. It's a peer review published article on parachute use to prevent death and major trauma related to gravitational challenge. It's a systematic review of randomized controlled trials from the British Medical Journal, totally PubMedable. Uh, so you can look up this reference yourself. And if you can't read the graphic at the bottom, it says parachutes reduce the risk of injury after gravitational challenge, but their effectiveness has not been proved with randomized controlled trials. And so when you look at the data out there on um, uh, biologics, it's not dissimilar to the study on parachutes. Uh, it's not great. Uh, I'll go through some of the literature that's out there, but at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's fairly confounding and the FDA does not really help us with what's uh, on the shelf. And so when we think about fracture healing, I think some of this, uh, to, some of the debate as to which biologic we have to use takes a step back and takes us back to our basic science roots a little bit to talk about why, what, what, how do fractures heal? What keeps them from healing and uh, how does the biologic fit into all of this? And so things that are relevant are blood supply. Does your biologic potentially increase the blood supply to an area? Again, dead things don't heal, so if there's dead bone, it won't magically become alive again. Um, are your biomechanics um, uh, appropriate? We sort of heard a little bit earlier about not filling every hole in the locking plate and using multiple locking screws. Um, I think that's a, um, uh, it, that's a problem from a biomechanical standpoint, and so I'll put an 18-hole plate on, I'll use six screws. Uh, and so I think that uh, fixation strategies are an important part of why fractures heal. But again, um, your biologic may not aid in that. So that's more of a iatrogenic reason why fractures may or may not heal. Infection. You know, infection will keep fractures from healing, and so does your biologic address that? Is it a combination product that has antibiotics in it, or do you make it a combination product using it off-label and add antibiotics to it to help either eradicate or prevent uh, infection? And then what host factors, this is my second favorite tattoo from one of my patients. Um, I could share my first one, but not if it's, this is going to go online. Uh, and so um, host factors are important as well as what's the patient bring to the table and does your biologic address the patient's deficiencies? So um, is the patient vitamin D deficient, thyroid deficient, is there a testosterone issue, parathyroid, total protein, albumin, do they have some kind of systemic disease, are they taking seizure medications, do they smoke? All these factors will affect fracture healing, so it's important to consider does the biologic that you're adding address or uh, helps uh, alleviate some of those issues as well. And so there's two basic principles when you're going to take something off the shelf, and that is, does the graph supply that which the host lacks? And then, does the host supply that which is not inherent to the graft that you're putting in? Not every graft is made the same. Not every injury is the same. You've seen several x-rays in the last couple of days that show the differences between um, uh, the variety of injuries that we see. And so when you take something off the shelf, it really needs to make sense for that patient, for that injury, for the particular reason that you're using it. And so when we talk about principles of, of bone graft substitutes, is it biocompatible? Is it bioresorbable? Is it osteoconductive, osteoinductive? Is it structural, if you need it to be structural? Is it easy to use? And probably what's most important in our hands, is it cost effective? I can tell you that our institution, not that I use much BMP at all anymore, 
but our institution has banned BMP use unless you're using it for on-label indications. Now, for those of you who've read a lot about BMP2, you'll know that 85% of its use nationally is off-label, right? So they've effectively eliminated our ability to use it because when we were using it at our institution, we were using it for off-label indications. Uh, and so the reason they did that was because it was $5,000 a pop. And so for that reason, you have to think about whatever you're using, is it cost effective in that, in that arena? And as we move towards bundled payments, and it's going to happen for trauma, just a matter of time, it's already happened for hip fractures, um, you have to think about, does this fit within the bundle that we're applying to ankle fractures or hip fractures or non-unions? So what do you want your bone graft to do? Do you want it to be osteogenic? What does that mean? It means, do you want it to bring cells that will eventually become bone? to the area? Do you need biology? Biology in the sense of cells. Do you need it to be osteoconductive? You've got the cellular cells there. You've got the induction factors there. You've got a good blood supply. It just needs a framework on which the cells will build, a scaffold, if you will. Do you need something that's going to be osteoconductive? And a good example of this is like a tibial plateau fracture. We're using structural mechanical bone graft to support your articular block rather than have it collapse down. And so does it provide that mechanical block that the, that the normal metaphyseal bone can then grow into? Or do you need something that's osteoinductive? Do you need something that's going to stimulate the cells that are there to become bone? The classic example of this is BMP. Do you need something that's going to trigger an on switch in those cells to make bone? So this is, these, this is useful in areas that may be devoid of blood. Right? A poor blood supply or a dysvascular area where you need to bring all the ingredients to make bone, including the osteoinductive factors like your BMPs and your VEGFs and your FGFs and that sort of thing. And does your graph have the capability to remodel? And does it have the ability to permeate and allow for blood flow through it? One of the things that we found with induced membranes and bone grafting is if you take all that rea bone graft and you pack it into a defect, the center of that graft never actually remodels. It never sees load. It never sees a blood supply. And if you go back in, because I've had this opportunity to go back into those graphs and you get into the middle of it, it's just bone graft. It's never remodeled because it's never felt load. It's never seen a blood supply. So when we do those induced membranes now, we, we, we take those large uh, amounts of rhea, we'll actually leave behind a canal if you're doing it for like a femoral shaft or a tibial shaft. So we'll use a, a, a um, uh, uh, mesh or something to that effect to almost create a intramedullary canal and an extramedullary cortex for that bone to grow in and grow around so that that bone can feel load. So does your bone graft allow for that as well? Will it allow for permeation of blood supply? And so there's lots of options out there when you look at the shelf, right? There's allograft options. Go in the freezer and just pick, take some cadaver bone, bike, biker in a bottle, if you will. And there's lots of graft alternatives. There's bone minerals, bone scaffolds, growth factors. You can use cellular things. You can use ultrasound or electricity. And you can use some combination thereof and throw the kitchen sink at it. And sometimes when you look at this, have we sort of followed the technology over reason capacity? Have we sort of, sort of gone from having what makes sense like iliac crest bone graft and really kind of gone off the deep end? And when you start to look at the data, there's lots of stuff out there. This is from JBMR. This is um, uh, fibroblast growth factor, uh, very powerful tool. They found that uh, in patients, it led to radiographic union uh, compared to placebo. It's not available in the US yet, but it's on its way. Um, and they showed some dramatic results on this in their study. Um, there's also bone morphogenic proteins, probably what we're probably most, common with, uh, most commonly familiar with. This is your BMPs. Right? So this is RHBMP2, only on label for open tibia fractures, treated with IM nails and anterior spinal fusions. As I mentioned before, significant off-label use, such as non-unions and posterior lumbar fusions. Uh, Well-done study, well-powered study, 450 patients. Um, they showed lots of good data, including uh, less invasive interventions and less hardware failures in their non-unions. Uh, what they also said was that they had less infections. Turns out when you do a subgroup analysis that Mo Bandari did out of uh, Canada, out of uh, Hamilton, Ontario, um, they, uh, McMaster, they found that um, that's not actually true. The subgroup analysis showed that they actually in increased your risk of infection when you put BMP into an, uh, into an open wound or a um, non-union. And then the study came out. Um, again, showing some of the industry involvement from Tim Cooklow and, and uh, the military group um, looking at and JBJS British. And this was the only published study that showed that a uh, synthetic material or a 
uh, a commercially available material was better than iliac crest bone graft for uh, fractures. And it was a tremendously well-received study. Uh, it was well-published, picked up in the media um, until it turned out that the data was falsified. Uh, and so to this day, there's still no data to support uh, a synthetic or a off-the-shelf option is better than iliac crest bone grafting. BMP7 was also available for some period of time, but it's been pulled off the, off the U.S. market, still available internationally. You have things like ultrasound that are available post-operatively to do, uh, and this is not a bone graft, but it does stimulate fracture healing. You have things like bone marrow aspirates. Uh, you can do uh, cellular concentration of these. You'll take bone marrow from either the peripheral, uh, you can take bone marrow from the uh, iliac crest, uh, or you can take it from other regions, but iliac crest is ideal. You can also take peripheral blood if you want, and you can concentrate it, and then you can inject it into the fracture site. Uh, or you can take this material and augment it with um, some other material, like allograft or DBM, uh, and then apply it to a non-union or uh, acute fracture site. Uh, this is a paper from Herzegu, who's done a lot of work looking at autologous bone graft uh, for non-unions, and he's taken these patients uh, and not taken them to the operating room, done uh, harvesting from their crest with a needle, uh, and then centrifuged it down, and then in injected it into the non-union site without doing any further intervention, so no revision surgery per se. And he's got some pretty tremendous results in terms of getting uh, union. Um, 53 out of 60 patients treated uh, in this manner without revision of hardware. I can tell you that um, the U.S. data from those sites that are doing it common in the U.S. is not quite as um, good as the Herzegu data from France, but it's not bad, and it's an option if you want to minimally invasively manage your non-unions. Um, there's also things available like demineralized bone matrix. So this is an osteoconductive and osteoinductive product. Uh, it's not osteogenic, um, so it has some growth factors. It's cat cadaveric bone that's been essentially acid washed, like your genes. Um, there are also ceramics that are out there, hydroxyapatite, uh, trial calcium phosphate, uh, they have, they mimic the structure of bone, so they've got the same porosity allowing for good ingrowth. Uh, they have an osteoconductive framework. They're a bit more brittle than, say, a crushed allograft, uh, so they have low tensile strength. So if you're looking for good mechanical support from them, you may not get it depending on what kind of bone you're putting in and what kind of load bearing you're doing. Um, you can also start to use different tricalcium phosphates or HA-coated implants or HA-coated uh, materials. Uh, you can also mix things into these materials like antibiotics. Again, off-label use, but it's an option if you want to do local antibiotic delivery. Um, you have to be careful that sometimes when, these, when you mix the antibiotic into them, you change the properties of the way they harden, so you have to take that into account because uh, sometimes you'll be setting up for about 20 to 30 minutes of hardening time with some of this material if you don't add the right combination of antibiotic liquid and um, carrier. So when we talk about biologics off the shelf, I think you have to take, take a step back and think a little bit about what your surgical technique is, because biologics won't tump, trump bad surgical technique. Uh, use good principles in terms of approaching your uh, fractures, whether they're acute open fractures or delayed grafting of open fractures or non-unions. Understand that there's lots of options that are out there for you to choose from in terms of biologic use. You have to figure out what fits in best with what you're trying to do, and what part of that amounts to understanding what the host resources are uh, when you look at your patients, and also what the graft properties are when you apply them to the non-union site or uh, injury site. There are non-invasive options that are out there, out there like the autologous bone, graft, uh, bone marrow concentrating systems and the electricity and ultrasound devices that are out there that are minimally or non-invasive rather than doing something like this. Um, remember that host factors still play a role, so you have to remember that you have to correct their vitamin D deficiencies and their thyroid deficiencies, get them to quit smoking if you can. Um, understand that there's a cost associated with all these biologics and how does that affect your uh, decision making or your institution's ability to allow you to make decisions. And then nothing is really holy water. Uh, remember, you still have to bring your own surgical technique and surgical skill set to the management and care of these patients. Thank you.